future. Let's read it together. To the angel of the church of Ephesus right? These things says he who holds the seven stars in his right hand, who walks in the midst of the seven golden lampstands. I know your works, your labor, your patience, and that you cannot bear those who are evil. And you have tested it. Those who say they are apostles and are not, and have found them liars. And you have persevered and have patience and have labored for my name's sake and have not become weary. Nevertheless, I have this against you that you have left your first love. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you quickly and remove your lampstand from its place, unless you repent. But this you have, that you hate the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. To him who overcomes, I will give to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Amen. Next, let me read you what Augustine, one of the most uh, the top theologians that ever uh, lived uh, in the Christendom, that's Augustine of uh, uh, North Africa, Algeria, uh, the fourth century. Uh, <clears throat> Love and do what you will. Love <coughs> and do what, uh, what you will. If you hold your peace, hold your peace out of love. If you cry out, cry out in love. If you correct someone, correct them out of love. If you spare them, spare them out of love. Let the root of love be in you. Nothing can spring from it but through. Amen? Amen. Yes, so that's also said, an unexamined life is not worth living. So, the scripture also says the same. In the scripture that I read first, yeah. remember, where you have fallen, which means examine yourself. So we'll be talking about love, first love, and examining ourselves with that, with that parameter, the, 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 the litmus test of our spiritual life is love. Love is the epitome of Christendom, Christian love. We are to become the embodiment of Christ's love. Love came to this world. Do you know who that is? God is love. But God came in the person of Jesus Christ. Love came and walked and dwelt among us. We came to see that love personified. And as he left, he represented us. We are to become the embodiment of Christ's love. You see, the message in, the, in uh, uh, Revelation chapter 2, you can go back, go, go back to the, the first scripture as, uh, which, uh, which we read, was written, was sent to the pastor, the angel of the church of Ephesus. The word angel in the Hebrew, it, it, it means messenger. So the, the, the messenger, which is translated angel here, is the pastor of the church. So in the church, and also in the life of the pastor, there is something important missing. The Lord is saying, I know what you do. I know your works. I know your labor. I know your uh, patience. I know your perseverance. 
I know you, you, you do all for my name. You go to a great extent without being weary. You've done this, you've done that, all check. Right, right, right. I know how you walk, I know how you live, I know your giving, I know your charity, I know your commitment, I know your sacrifice, I know you love you how you love others, I know how you walk in the family. Everything is good, good, good. But nevertheless, nevertheless, everything is good, but in spite of all this good. I have something against you. Oh, that's very, very uh, important <coughs> to note. When the Lord says, I have something against you, mm. that's powerful. And he's saying, I have something against you. What? You left your first love. Mm. You left your first love. So for the Lord, as far as the Lord is concerned, Every activity we do in church or in life, every Christian activity that we do in church, or the work, or the labor, the preaching, the teaching, the singing, the fellowship, the giving, add it on. Love is above all that. It becomes worthless. <clears throat> A ritual, a religion, all these active, good activities devoid of the love of Jesus, the love of God, the love that we have for people, for the people of God. Devoid of that, it becomes a routine, it's a cult, it, it becomes a religion, a dead religion. And Jesus says, I am coming, I'm going to take away all the gifts that I gave you because you have ceased to walk in love. So we need to take that measurement called love and always to test our temperature, the temperature of our spiritual life every day. How am I loving? I may be so good to my wife. I may do so good things. The doing part is good, but all the things that I do must emanate from, from love. And I have to always check my heart. Do I love her the way I should? Do I love her? People are around me. I tell you, many ministers, preachers, they struggle to love people. They're good in preaching. And I tell you, unless we take a conscious, a conscious test and check and examine ourselves, it's very easy to live loveless and be look like good. Because we do the things that a Christian does as, as a culture, as a routine. We welcome people, we hug people, we give in the church. That is not God's measurement. That's our measurement. We think we are good. Probably the pastor here, he thought he is good because he's doing the things that the Lord commissioned him to do. The Lord said, I know your labor. I know your work. I know your sacrifice. I know you, you, your uh, uh, strength for doctrine and purity. You didn't tolerate those who say they are apostles and you tested them and they, they are liars. They are not. You took a position. I know that. <coughs> but your first love, you left it. He didn't say you lost it. Losing something and leaving something are two different things. If you lose it, you, you, you don't know where you lost it. But if you leave it somewhere, it could be intentional or negligent. So if you left your key when you go to a car, if you left your car at home, what do you do? Huh? Are you here? What do you do if you left your car at home when you go to your car? Huh? You go back. Yes. Isn't it? Yeah. So Jesus said, repent. In other words, return. You left your first love. Mm. Who is your first love, by the way? The love is personified. You left your first love. Your first love is Jesus himself. Is it for, possible for Christians 
to leave Jesus? Oh, yes, it's possible for Christians to leave Jesus and walk by themselves. You remember mother and father when Jesus was 12? They left him in the temple. And I tell you, many Christians leave Jesus in the church and go alone. Every Sunday when we meet, we spend quality time with Jesus. But how many Christians leave Jesus in the temple and go by themselves? Go with the motions of life. And to their shock, they will find after three days, where is Jesus? I don't see him. I'm by my alone here. Jesus is not there. And the father and the mother had to go back three days' journey to find the first last the love, the child Jesus they lost in the temple. My brothers and sisters, while we are doing Christian activities, let's not lose our first love, Jesus, in the church. Let's not leave him there and go. So it's important for Christians to check in every time. Is the Lord with me? Am I with the Lord always? You see, you remember the disciples who were on the way to Emmaus. I think they were in Luke chapter 24. You remember them? They were going by themselves, leaving Jesus to yesterday. They told Jesus, three days ago, Jesus was a mighty prophet. Three days ago, Jesus did this and that. And we hoped that he was going to bring the redemption of Israel. They left Jesus three days ago. And Jesus was going with them, walking with them. And so through his teaching, he revealed himself to them. And they had, they had to go back in time. The Jesus they left three days ago. The Jesus they said who was alive three days ago and is no more. He is still alive. They had to go back in time. Jesus is alive. Amen. They left Jesus to yesterday. How many Christians, even now, we have left Jesus in our yesteryear experiences? He was there in our life 10 years ago, and we have left Him there, and we are walking by ourselves. And the Holy Spirit is nudging us to go back to that first love. Those who left Jesus in place, they had to go back to that place. Those who left Jesus in time, they have to go back to that first love. I am saying this because I know from experience, because I have been in that journey also. As a Christian, there were moments when I left Jesus somewhere. I was a Christian, but I'm walking, I'm going through the motions by myself and the Holy Spirit kept on nudging me to go back and have that Jesus find that Jesus you have left your first love are you in that first love with the Lord do you know when God gave us the, His commandments, the first thing that came to Him is love the Lord your God with all your heart, Amen. with all your soul, with all your all strength. God doesn't exaggerate. Why does He have to say three times with all? With all, Wendy. With all, it's not with some, it's not with half. The call for you is to love God with all your being. Until you love Him with all of your being, you have no love Him. 
the same to me, the same to you. Let's go back to that first love. God doesn't measure our life by any other standard than by his own self, by himself. And who is he? Who is he? Love. He is love. He measures our walk with him by himself, by love. It was a Pharisee. You remember the parable of Jesus, the Pharisees and the Pharisee and the tax collector who went to the temple for prayer? And what did the Pharisee say? I thank you, God. I'm not like those adulterers, idolaters, liars. In fact, I fast two days a week. I tithe from all what. By the way, he was telling the truth. But God didn't hear that prayer because God didn't measure anyone by the activities we do. And he said, I am not like this tax collector. That's not love. We measure our Christian walk by the things we do in the church and we think, even though we don't say it, we think we are better than others. What difference does it make? The Pharisees said it, we didn't say it, but we, we, we feel it. God measures our life by love. Amen. So, where is the gauge of your tank, love tank? Where is it? We need to measure that. Am I a loving person? It's a question that we need to ask every day. Am I a loving person? Do others say that I am a loving person? Oh, love doesn't come natural to us. Love that comes natural to us is self-love. It happens every day. Consciously, unconsciously. We see the world. We're putting ourselves at the center of everything from our perspective. That's why in our conversation, if we take an inventory of the language that we use every day, there is a lot of I, me, myself in the language itself. So that's the natural pro propensity of a fallen man, a fallen woman. And God is going to restore us. He wants to restore us to how he intended us to be. The embodiments of love. <coughs> when God measures our, the temperature of our Christian life, the health of our Christian life, he doesn't measure it by outward activities. Is it not what the doctor does? He measures your health by checking your heart. The doctor doesn't uh, determine your health by checking what you do. No. He takes a measurement to your heart. And the doctor of doctors, Jesus, also takes his measurement and measure our love life mm -hmm. to determine the health of our, our, our spiritual health. Mm -hmm. If we grow in the Lord, let's not grow in any other thing. Let's grow in love. And it's intentional. We can change ourselves intentionally. That, so change take an inventory of ourselves and say, that's not love. I should not speak like that. That's not love. I should not treat that person this way. That's not love. Let me show the love of Jesus. But there is one problem here. I cannot invent love in me. The starting point to love someone is 
to receive love for ourselves first and foremost. God's love. And the enemy's tactic is he stops us from receiving the love of the Father. Do you know the person in the, in, uh, the disciple in the, in the, uh, among the Jesus' disciples who is known as the apostle of love? John. But wasn't he the same person whom Jesus called son of thunder? <laughs> Which means a raging man, a man of fury. Why? Because he was brash, he was selfish. Didn't he say that, Lord, do you want us to call fire from heaven as Elijah did and burn all these Samaritans? For one mistake, they said that we don't, we, don't want, we don't want to allow Jesus to pass through our village. He wanted to kill every Samaritan. That was him. And when it comes to having the best seat in the kingdom of heaven, oh, he and his brother James conspired together and they involved in their mother and they brought their mother to Jesus. And you know, in that culture, they respect the elderly and especially mothers. So if you ask him, he will not say no. Go and ask the, the two thrones left and right for us. Book that for us. <laughs> and they went and they asked him that was selfish that's not love that's not a loving person why did they choose the best place for themselves they called fire they wanted to call fire on others to burn them for that very reason Jesus calls them thunders of th sons of thunder. They were also among the disciples when they debated among themselves who is the best among us, who is, who is better. No, it's me, no, 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 it's me, no, it's me. They were there. And so Jesus took these people as his disciples to reach out the world through love and, hallelujah, at the end of the three years journey with Jesus, these furious man, this is man of rage, man of fury, John, became the paragon of love, mm -hmm. the preacher, the apostle of love. And you know, in the gospel of John, John used 57 times the word love. That is two-thirds of the total word, uh, word love used in the Old New Testament. And he used another 46 times in the first episode, first, uh, first Job. He used more than 100 times the word love. Love, 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 love. I can, I can read you some of them. Uh, my wife, you can go to, uh, until you, you get First John, a lot of scriptures you have to pass. First John chapter 2? Yes. He who loves his brother abides in the light, and there is no cause for stumbling in him. But he who hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going, because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And again, next verse. Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God. And next verse, this is the message that you heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. The next verse, he who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. Next verse, by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for our brethren. But whoever has these world's roots and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. 
Next verse. This is His commandment, that we should believe on the name of the, His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. Next verse. Beloved, let's love one another, for love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. In these the love of God was manifested toward, toward us that God has sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. In this is love. Not that we love God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has seen God at any time. If we love one another, God abides us in us. And his love has been perfected in us. Next verse. And we have known and delivered the love that God has for us. God is love. And he who abides in love abides in God. And God in him. Love has been perfected among us in this. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment. Because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. If someone says, I love God and he hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he has not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Next verse, everyone who believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God, and everyone who loves the Father loves his child as well. This is how we know that we love the children of God, by loving God and carrying out his commands. In fact, this is love for God to keep his commands. Love, 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 love. Amen. Amen. Love. A man of rage changed to a man of love. How is that possible? He walked with Jesus three years. You can put anyone in any university, Harvard, Oxford, a man of anger will not change into a preacher of love, a martyr of love. No. You can change his head, you cannot change his heart. No education, no college, no university in the whole earth can change the heart of a fallen man. Walk with Jesus, the corrupt man, like John, changed into a mantle of love. But he has also another mystery. How do we know John in the gospel? How is the Holy Spirit, how did the Holy Spirit paint John for us? John said, how did John describe himself? He never wrote his name in his gospel or in the epistles. He didn't say, I, John, wrote this. But he said, he described himself like this. The disciple whom the Lord loves. I want you to, to keep this in mind. He called himself, I am the disciple whom the Lord loves. And the, another thing the Holy Spirit gave us a picture of John is, you remember in John chapter 13, 13 when the Last Supper, before Jesus was betrayed, even Peter was so shy to speak at that. He was not like, like he was before, like, you know, he's always the speaker and fast. But at that time, he just touched John and can you ask him who is going to betray him? And John, the Bible says twice, he leaned on the bosom of Jesus. He leaned on the breast of Jesus. That's the picture we have of John. You know, it's not news reports. The, 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 Holy Spirit, the, the writers of the gospel are not writing like a reporter. The Holy Spirit is 
giving them words, words that will be message for everyone, for all time. And so when that is, when John is described that way, we are seeing his inner personality. He is a man who leans to the bosom of the Lord. The Lord is saying, you have left your first love. How do we get it? Let's learn from the apostle of love. You know how he got it? He's always leaning in the bosom of the Lord Jesus. Let that be our continuous journey. Let's keep on leaning on him. Leaning to the bosom of the Lord Jesus. That's where you get love. You know how you get love? As I say, one has to know that he is loved first. One has to receive the love of God to be able to Oh, if you listen to people when they talk, <coughs> the anger in them, the words, the expression they use, the explosive words they use, the choice of language, you know that these people have been hurt in the past. There is a wound in them that is not healed. If your language is, is harsh, hard, strong, you're not a bad person. You are a wounded person. And that wound has not been healed. You see, when the Lord anoints us, He anoints us with oil so that that wound soothes, heals. He doesn't anoint us with vinegar. <laughs> but some people's language looks like these people have been anointed with vinegar. And if they have been anointed with vinegar, we know who did it. In the drudgery of life, in the struggle of life, in the friction with people, these people have a wounded soul that has not healed. And John was one of them. That's why he was raging. We don't know what happened to him, but he, is, he had anger issues. And so, the antidote for brashness, anger, fury, is to lean on the heart of Jesus and receive love. Where did John got that expression, that language? I am the disciple whom the Lord loves. You see, as he leaned in the bosom of Jesus, he received love, full love for himself. He, he came to know the love of God for himself. Because if you read Romans 5.5, 5, the love of God is poured into us through the Holy Spirit. Amen. The love of God is poured into us through the Holy Spirit. So when he leaned in Jesus, he was tapping into that love of God. And he received love. And he knew he can identify himself different from others. I am the one who is loved by the Lord. Let me show you a different picture of a different picture of another disciple. Peter. When Jesus came back to him to restore him, Jesus asked him, Do you love me? You know I do, I love you. That's the paradigm that Peter is walking. He, the paradigm that Peter is walking, I am the one who loves the Lord. But the paradigm that John is walking is, I am the one whom the Lord loves. Do you see the difference? And so when given an assignment, the one who says, I am the one who loves the Lord, he was given, tend my sheep. But the one who says, I am the one whom the Lord loves, take care of my mom. Yeah. Those who love, who receive love, 
they have the propensity to give love. Those who receive love the most, they have the, the, the ability to give it, to extend it to others. And because of that, they are trusted for a higher call in the kingdom. Mm. Take care of my mom. And so, to go back to that first love, if we left our first love, we are not here to be condemned. The Holy Spirit is not condemning us now. He is just gently guiding us where to get it. And so the way to get it is because we are wounded and, you know, the pastor in Ephesus church lost, left his first love because he was dealing with tough people in the church. The Nikolai times. It, if I explain, it will take me a uh, lot. Uh, so I say, these are difficult people in the church who introduce uh, slackness, conflict in the church. And so in dealing with tough people, slowly, slowly he lost his first love. And the Lord came to remind him, no, what you're doing is good, but love has to be restored in your heart. And so the way to restore is to continuously lean on the Lord and Jesus himself. Why do we lean on Him? As we come closer to Him, we receive the love of God. That we are loved. We will say like to, I am the one the Lord loves. The Lord loves me. God loves me. No, it's not, it's, it, it will not be a, a, a mental ascent. We feel it. We feel the love of God. Until we feel it, we have not got it. Because love is not a mental ascent. We feel the love of God inside of us and we are content. We are, we know we are accepted. We are reassured. So what oozes out of us is love. We can love the unlovable. Uh, Jack Hayes, one of the, the top uh, man of God. He said, you, do, you don't love until you love the unlovable. You, you, you're not walking in love until you begin to love the unlovable. Because the good, the, the good people are not the lovable people are not the measurements until we love the unlovable when we are walking in love. And how, how, how do we love those? <coughs> when we receive love of God and the cloak. And we got that love, we get that love from God as we keep on leaning to Him, leaning on Him. Lean not on your own understanding, says the scripture. Another is leaning on the Lord is one. Another way of getting back that love life is a continuous prayer life. By the way, leaning on the Lord is more than having prayer life. It's more than fasting and spending time with the Lord. It's more than the day-to-day -day things. Leaning with, on the Lord is an, a, a, a continuous, intentional seeking of the Lord until we establish intimate relationship with Him, intimacy with the Lord defines Him. Paul in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, and also from 17 to 19, said, For this reason I bow my knees 
to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. I bow my knees so that you will know the love of Jesus Christ that surpasses knowledge. It is beyond understanding. It's it surpasses human understanding. It surpasses knowledge. Yet I kneel down and pray that you would know this love that surpasses knowledge. And so Paul is praying because through prayer it's possible to get back that love life. No amount of sitting in the church and listening to preaching will, will give us that love life. It's a personal journey. It's an individual walk to develop a prayer life. Prayer life when we sit alone, when we sleep. It's not where the words that we say, but a deep yearning in our soul. God, I want to be who you want me to be. I want to know you. I want to be close to you. I want to receive your heavenly virtues into me. And as we keep on praying, seeking without us knowing it, that love begins to manifest in our lives. We don't, we don't know where it ended and where it began. It just like happens and people begin to experience it. We be begin to be embodiments of Christ's love. As we keep on leaning on Him, we receive the love of God. I'm finishing. Curious, it makes me curious that this uh, conversation between Jesus and Peter. Do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Three times. In the English, we don't know the distinction because in the conversation of Peter and Jesus, both of them, the word used is love. But in the Greek, there is, Jesus is using a different word, and Peter is using a different word. Jesus is using the highest degree of love. He is saying, do you agape me? And he's using the word agape. And Peter, when he says, I guess, Lord, I love you, he is using a different word. He is saying, I feel a of you, not agape. And the second question again, do you agape me? Which means, do you love me unconditionally? Because agape is unconditional love. But Peter says, yes, Lord, I do feel a of you. On the third time, Jesus lowered the standard because he's, he's not there. So he said, okay, do you feel a of you? Filet of me. Then he said, yes, I do. Filet, filet. In other words, the conversation is, do you love me unconditionally? Yes, Lord, I like you. Do you love me unconditionally? Yes, Lord, I like you. Why? Why is Peter saying this? Of course he loves him. But he had a terrible experience. He said to the Lord before, even if these all betray you, I will not. I am ready to die with you. How terribly he lost. He betrayed him. Now, when Jesus came back 
from there. He didn't have that boldness anymore. So he, he, he didn't want to. Probably in the Hebrew, the conversation, they used the same word. But what Holy Spirit, when he, when he made that dialogue to be written in Greek, intentionally the Holy Spirit used two different words to show us what's going on in the heart of Peter. He is not in the same league with Jesus. Why? He was captive to his past. He, he failed in the past, now he is afraid. He is, he is still whole captive of his, his failure in the past. You see, one thing the enemy uses to hold us from the love of God is by reminding us our past failures. That's terrible. It holds Peter captive. So we need to detach ourselves from the past, knowing that the past is forgiven. And be able to receive the love of God. That God loves us. When we allow the heart, our heart to receive the love of God, we, that's the first step we have begun to, to share the love of God to others. May the Holy Spirit help us. To get back that first love. Yeah. We don't measure our walk in the Lord by any other standard than that. You see, Jesus is telling the pastor in the church of Jesus, until you do the things you do out of love, all you do is worthless. Let's take that litmus taste for ourselves today and check our life with us. Am I a loving person? We can change, we can grow as we keep on leading to the bosom of Jesus Christ. Amen. Praise God. Let's stand in the presence of the Lord.